We're coming back to the book of Galatians, and as you remember, probably we, we have a little bit unusual approach this time. We covered these several verses uh, first in the greater, bigger context and focused on the, the whole uh, second uh, part of uh, chapter 5, and then decided to focus on some details, and there is a reason for that. These details present to us um, great detailed description of what our Christianity looks, how it looks in practical terms. When we are talking about us being in Christ, us being saved by Christ, the Bible is very specific, it's very precise, it's written in such a way that it gives us direct way how we follow Christ. What does it mean to be a Christian? It's not just words, it's not just ideas, it's just practical life, and God wants us to have this life, and this is why we go back and back to the Word of God and studying what is, it's presenting to us. You remember that the book of Galatians presents to us the gospel. The gospel is the center of our life. The essence of the gospel is that Christ Jesus came to this earth and he lived a perfect holy life and he came to the cross and accepted our sins and accepted all the punishment which belonged to us. He took it upon himself and he died because of that. He died and rose again and as a result of what Christ did for us at the cross, we now have righteousness of Christ. His perfect absolute righteousness, 100% pure. So he gives it to us, and now we are free from sin, free from condemnation, and now we have that righteousness of, of Christ in our lives. So that's the essence of the gospel. And Paul is presenting this gospel in the book of Galatians, and he makes sure that everyone who consider, who thinks about himself or herself as a Christian, that they would understand that, that they, they understand that it's not something that we earn. It's not something which is done by works. It, it never can be achieved by keeping all the commandments. The only way how we can get salvation from Christ is the gospel, which means that Christ died for us at the cross and he had given to us his perfect righteousness and now we have that righteousness. And in the second part of the book of Galatians, Paul presents to us another very important facet, side of the gospel. The gospel is not an ideology. It's not something that we just agree on. It's not a philosophy that we entertain and we think about that and we see that it's a great explanation of reality. Yes, the Bible presents the best explanation of reality which is uh, possible. Yeah, that's true. But the gospel is something much more and much more important. The gospel is power. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 16, Paul writes very clearly that the gospel is the power for, for salvation. And that word which is translated into English as power is in the uh, original, it, it comes from the word uh, which, which we have word dynamite. So the gospel in itself has energy. And because it has energy, it acts, it works. It cannot be passive. The gospel is something that comes into our lives and that makes us different and that moves us into certain direction. And this is what Paul is explaining to us in the second half of the uh, book of Galatians. In theology, in Christian circles, this process is usually called sanctification. And when people think about sanctification, they quite often think about some church process, something which is far removed from reality. I know that it should be. I know that it is important, but I really don't know how to come to grips with it. I don't know how it works in my life. 
Yeah, I know that I need to read the Bible more. Yeah, I know that I need to spend more time praying. This is about it. So because of that, knowing that problem, Paul presents to us a detailed explanation how it works. And if you remember, we started from verse 13. Let's read it once again. Verse 13, chapter 5. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So he starts with the idea of freedom, idea of liberty, and the gospel does liberate. It, it gives us true freedom. And he warns us that we quite often can mix it. We can, we can uh, think about freedom in wrong terms. And he, he warns us that we can have freedom for flesh. And he said, no, 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 this is not the gospel. This is not true freedom. This is not freedom at all. This freedom will lead to destruction. And he continues on in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. So he explains that in the life of a believer, there are two sources, two different sources of desires, ideas, uh, feelings, and that's reality in Christian life. And these two different sources, they're working in opposite direction. They oppose each other. And we live in this war zone. And we understand that this war zone is a reality, and we need to know that, remember about that, and we need to, to be aware of what we do in this situation. In order to help us to understand this word, though, and he brings, Paul brings to us two explanations, how the flesh is acting and what is the spirit doing within us. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. So these are sexual side of flesh, so flesh is moving us to that direction. And every time when we see any kind of desires within us which lead us to this, this direction, we understand that this is flesh. And then idolatry and sorcery, this is, we are trying, when, when people are trying to get God under their control, and then enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, uh, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we spent the whole sermon last time explaining why is that and how it works and how it's expressed in our lives. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, this is what the Spirit, Holy Spirit is doing within us. So the fruit of the Spirit is a result of the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So we discussed all of that, and today we come to two short but very important uh, verses. This is something that if we miss that, we don't understand the reality of Christian life. Verses 24 and 25. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. These two verses help us to understand the spiritual war that rages within us, and it it, it helps us to understand that we are not dealing with two equal sources. Probably you heard the illustration about two dogs, Black dog and white dog. Some, uh, that, that illustration was popularized years ago by one well-known preacher. And usually people think that a dark black dog is uh, flesh and white dog is your spirit. And the essence of illustration that if you feed black dog, so he, he will win. If you feed, feed white dog, so the white dog will win. 
So the, the morale of that is feed white dog and you will be on top all the time. But this is not a correct illustration. These two powers that, that are working within us, they are not equal. And this is what this passage is explaining to us. It clearly states that our new regenerated nature has priority above our flesh. This is our regenerated nature is our true self now. This is what we will see now studying these two passages, and I hope, I pray that the Holy Spirit will help us to understand that. It starts with the important area, important element of our faith is a union with Christ. We see that from this first phrase, these several words. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. That's an interesting statement, which is not, not exactly in a correct way translated here in the English. There is an idea of belonging, but actually the correct way would be to translate it by those who are Christ's. So it means that it's, not, it's, it's much bigger than just an idea of belonging. It's like you are talking about your kids. Do your, do your kids belong to you? Not in the same way how your car belongs to you. Of course, probably your car belongs to the bank, maybe. But not in this, not in this uh, sense. So your kids, they are not just belonging to you. They are yours. And when, when you say these are my kids, you mean something much greater. They probably are grown up already and they, they in no way belong to you anymore. They are not part of your household. They live separately. But they are still your kids. This is the sense here. So when, when we see the... But, and those who belong to Christ, yeah, that's probably the, the best way to expre express it in English. In Russian, we have it in a very clear way. But те, которые Христовы. But those who are Christ's. So this is the idea which, which kind of helps us to understand everything that we belong to Christ. This is not the first time that Paul is speaking about in this passage, in this epistle. Uh, if you go back to chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. So he speaks about that essential union, unity between a redeemed human soul and Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, we become sons of God through faith. When we trust into Jesus Christ, we are united with, with, with him and through him united to, to God. For as many of you uh, as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Salvation and all his blessings, they are associated only with Christ. They are found in Christ. Quite often, people understand God or Christ as Santa Claus. You know, Santa Claus comes and gives gifts. So this is how we think. Christ comes and gives salvation, forgiveness of sins, righteousness, redemption, heavenly inheritance, adoption. So this is how we think. But the Bible presents a completely different picture. All of those blessings are in Christ Jesus. They are not separable from Him. You cannot separate salvation from Christ. You cannot separate adoption from Christ. You cannot separate righteousness from Christ. We become righteous only when we are in Christ. This is the way how it's presented in the, in the gospel, in the Bible, in New Testament, and even Old Testament. Look with me, Ephesians, uh, we, we will see chapter 1, several verses in that chapter, uh, verse 3. Blessed be the God and, the, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in, in Christ 
with ever spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So we are blessed in Christ, not by Christ, not just Christ sent his gifts from heaven to us. No, we are blessed in Christ. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the Lord, of the world, he, uh, verse 5, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. So our blessings are in Christ. They do not exist outside of Christ. Only in him we can be holy and blameless. He continues on verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through, through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. So it is inseparable from Christ. So only in him we have forgiveness, not outside of him. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 8, there is an interesting passage, verse 1. There, uh, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So outside of Christ Jesus, there is a condemnation. Inside of Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Ephesians 1.11, in him we have obtained an inheritance. So all the blessings that Christ gives to us, all of them are in him and in him only. And this is an important thing. We need to understand the nature of salvation, nature of the gospel, how it works. This can be compared to saving uh, how God saved Noah through, uh, during the flood. So the salvation was possible only in the ark. You could not take out salvation and give it to Noah or someone else outside of the ark. No, it's only in the ark. So they needed to be in that ark in order to be saved. But even this illustration is, illustration is imperfect. Uh, scripture provides to us several other illustrations. You remember the illustration where Christ is the head and we are the members of the body? So that, that means that head and the body, they have the same DNA. That's the main thing. Uh, the, that's what makes these parts belonging to each other because they are built in with the same basic material. The DNA is the same through all, through, through all the body. If uh, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 13, we read, For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body. And, they, and then he says, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And all were made to drink of one spirit. The word baptized means to be immersed. So reviving the soul from above, the Holy Spirit immerses us into the body of Christ connecting us to, by his invisible bonds with millions of other, saved, uh, other souls saved by Christ through his grace. So this is the basic idea, and we see it clearly presented in scriptures. I have several more, more verses, but let me switch now to the definition. Let, let us think about that process. Salvation and all the blessings associated with it are found only in Christ and become ours only when we are united with him. So this is a truth number one that we need to understand. Salvation and all the blessings associated with salvation are found only in, in Christ. It's not an ideology. It's not a philosophy. It's not something external. It is part of who Christ is. It's part of his nature. And they become ours only in one case. Only when we are united with Jesus Christ by faith. There was a Scottish preacher of 19th century. His name is William Cunningham. And he has a very clear statement about that. The covenant of redemption, you, you remember that uh, the salvation is a result of covenant, of the covenant that God has had between himself and his son. The covenant, covenant of redemption was made between the father and the son. For man was not directly and primarily a party to it. 
As Christ fulfilled the conditions of this covenant, so all the blessings that the covenant secured were bestowed upon him and continue in his possession. And this is what we need to remember. It's not just separated passage in the book of Galatians. This is the whole Bible. This is the general teaching of the whole Bible. The Bible presents to us the only way of salvation, that God is blessing his son as fully man and fully God who lived on this earth and he became our representative. And now that son, he had the victory on the cross. And now that son has inherited all of those blessings that are related to that. And all of those blessings become ours only when we are united to Christ. That's number one that we need to understand. This is a phrase in verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus. So the rest of this passage, uh, the rest of this passage in verses, the, the second half of verse 24 and the, uh, verse 25, they belong to those who are in Christ. But there is a second idea which we can discover in the later portion of this passage. And this idea speaks about our new identity in Christ. So our union with Christ and that's an important thing. And the second one, he speaks about our identity, who we are. All of us have our identity. There are different ways how people identify or what, uh, how identi our identity is being built or on, on what it is being built. Some people have uh, national identity, like, like people think about themselves, I am American. Or today we have resurgence of that national identity among Ukrainians. They say, I am Ukrainian, especially with the rest, you know, the latest events, the war and everything that happens. Or people say, I am Russian. You know, one national identity that probably the, the most uh, widely spread in the world is a Jewish identity. They live for several thousand years. They live in different places. They are just dispersed around the world. But they still think about themselves as Jews first. They, they have that Jewish identity within the, themselves. The, that determines the way how they, their social life, how they dress, uh, their religious life, and, and a lot of that. So there is a national identity. There are different other identities, like distinct professional identity. Like some people think about themselves, first of all, as a musician. So when he or she thinks about himself or herself, uh, they're musicians. Or in the past, especially in the military, there, there was an idea of um, military honor that, that some people were thinking about themselves as officer. I have that military honor. That's the part. Now probably only some special forces have that, that same idea, that bond, that they are Navy SEALs. And he is a Navy SEAL all the time, not just when he is on duty. That's part of his identity. That's, he invested into that so much of his life that that kind of became who he is. So this is an identity. There is a religious identity. Many representatives of Islam, they think about themselves first of all as Muslims. Everything else is after that. Their degrees, their profession, whatever they do in their trade, but they think about themselves first of all, I am a, I am a Muslim. So identity is an image of oneself through which a person views himself and his life. So this is what we need to understand, that this is our identity. It's a certain image that we have. Most often, we, it's subconscious image. It's not something that we kind of uh, wrote down definition. This is who I am. Maybe some people at some point, they, they are prompted to do that. But this, all people have, have an identity. So the scripture 
in this place speaks about our identity, but in a completely different, more important way, which in its significance exceeds everything else. So by becoming a Christian, a person is united with Christ and acquires a new identity in him. This is what, what Paul is teaching us here. This is what Scripture just screaming us to us, uh, screaming it to us. This is one of the most important reality of the gospel. The gospel coming into our lives changes our identity completely in a radical way. And that's an important part of what it means to be a Christian. Let's go back to Galatians 3. We already read verses 26 and 27. Let's read from 26 to 28. Paul is writing, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, therefore uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So when, when a Jew accepted Christ, he was still a Jew. Or when a woman accepts Christ, she is still a woman. But what he is saying here, he says that if for a Jew his Jewishness was the dominant reality of his self-image, his identity. Now when he had come to Christ and when he had united with Christ, now his Jewishness is far, far down the list. He is Christian, first of all. He is Christ. That's the new reality. And that's how the gospel works. That's the essence of the gospel. Galatians 5, 24, 25, let's read it again. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's an interesting statement. What Paul is saying here, he is saying about putting to death our old identity. That's the only way. This is how it happened. So when we are talking about our new identity in Christ, it starts with us dying to our old self. We have crucified. Quite often we read these words and we, we kind of agree. We just nod and we, we think it's, it's right. It's true. But we don't really know how it works. We don't really know how it's been applicable to us. Have you crucified your flesh? What would you answer to that? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. What does it mean? What kind of nails you used? When did it happen? But this is an important thing that we need to get in terms of our understanding of the process of sanctification and that will help us to understand the gospel in general. So we'll try to answer these two, two questions. How do we acquire our new identity in Christ? Question number one. Question number two. How do we live out this new identity in Christ? Let's read it once again. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. These words are explained by Apostle Paul, in detail, in the epistle of Romans. Thank you, Jeff, for reading that chapter 6. And we will go to this chapter and try to see what Paul is explaining. He is explaining here in detail what, what in the Galatians just explained in two verses. Chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into what? into his death. That's an important statement. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk, might walk in newness of life. 
So Apostle speaks here very categorically. Baptized into Christ. Jesus means that those who are immersed in the Christ, they are united with him together. And first of all, were united with him in death. On the cross of Calvary, not just our saints were present, but we ourselves were present in Christ. You remember that God lives above the time? And everybody who are saved by Christ or will be saved by Christ, they, they already were in Christ at the time of his death. This is how Paul presents it here. He continues on, verse 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. Charles Spurgeon has a great sermon on this topic and I would quote uh, several lines from that sermon. One of it, we are not baptized into his example or his life but into his death. That's an important idea. We need to understand that by becoming a Christian, by becoming Christians, we are not baptized just into the way of life, into the ideas, into the good commandments. We are baptized, we are united with him, we are baptized into his death. We hereby confess that all our salvation lies in the death of Christ, which death we accept as having been incurred, being incurred on our account. You are so one with Jesus that you must regard his death as your death. And he continues on, my burial with Christ means not only that he died for me, but also I died in him, so that my death with him needs a burial with him. Jesus died for us because he is one with us. That's exactly what Apostle Paul is telling us in chapter 6. And if we will continue verse 8, we see now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being, being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. This is our new identity in Christ. Again, if we continue, if we uh, go to that uh, Spurgeon sermon, one more passage from it. Our old legal life has been taken from, from us by the sentence of the law. And the law views us as dead. But now we have received a new life, a life out of death, resurrection, life in Christ Jesus. The life of the Christian is the life of Christ. This is why Scripture commands us when we believe to be baptized. Because when we are baptized, we are testifying to the whole world. Actually, tonight we'll have another baptismal service here. We have baptized 13 new members uh, at our uh, uh, service on Wednesday night, and we'll have another one today, tonight, and we'll have, I think, 14 more people who have uh, trusted into Christ, and now they will be here. So what will happen here? So when, we, when a person proclaims that he or she belongs to Christ, when we put them under the water, <clears throat> that signifies that I am dead to my old self. And when we are raising them from, from the water, we are testifying that I live in new life for Christ. This is our new identity. From the moment of our conversion, we are first of all the children of God. We are first of all Christians. Well, we are first of all Christ's, and then everything else. Then your profession, then your nationality, then everything else is after that. First Corinthians 16, we read here, verse 22, If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed, and I need to correct the translation here. There is no, in the original, this word, let him be. 
the actual, actual original text would read, if anyone has no love for the Lord, is accursed. So there is, there is no alternative. Either you are in Christ or you are under the curse. When you are in Christ, you love Christ Jesus. Christ is the dearest, the most precious. Everything in the universe, you cannot see anything more precious than Christ. So Christ becomes that the most precious object in our life. This is what Scripture is saying to us here. This is how it was in the life of the Apostle Paul. Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8 describe his experience. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You know, Paul had written about himself that he is a Jew. He was... uh, from the tribe of Benjamin, and he explained that he was a Pharisee, so he was very active in his faith, and his identity was built upon from that Jewishness, and, and he was a member of Pharisaic party, which was kind of the elite group among the Jews. Now he's saying, what he's saying, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss, for the sake of Christ. Why? Because when he found Christ, he understood from the very beginning that this is all that he needs. This is his new, uh, this is what he, what the, the new self that he discovered in Christ. Before that, his self was in Jewishness, in Judaism, in Pharisaism. Now he understood that Christ is everything that he needs. Look, that's an interesting thing. He continued to be a Jew. Uh, you cannot take his Jewishness from him. You cannot take it out. But his Jewishness is not the most important thing now. So when we come to Christ, the musician will continue to be a musician. But he will be Christ's musician. The people who think about themselves as about their nationality or about the way how they act or they do something. They, they invest their life into something. But the main thing which happens with every individual, there is a revolution when we come to Christ. And that, that's, the, first of all, the revolution of values. Christ destroys the old value system and he himself reigns. So this is the meaning of the word which we read here. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And we have a couple of more minutes just to address another question. How do we live with this new identity in Christ? Now we understand how we get it. When we trust Jesus... And we understand that we belong to him and he is the most important and everything else kind of moves to secondary or thirdary uh, place. Now how we live with it. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So if somebody will ask you, have you crucified your flesh? If you have new identity, identity in Christ, yes. That's what it means. I died with Christ. I died for my old self. This is what I have testified when I was baptized. That's a part of my new life now. And now in verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. When Christ comes into our lives, He destroys all sinful strongholds and I am different now, although I continue to feel pressure from the, from the flesh, and sometimes I lose, and sometimes I see that I fail, that that, that fight is, was not been won by me. I see that it's something which 
kind of uh, continues to build pressure on my life. But I know that my true self is now linked with Christ. So with my whole, is my whole perspective on, on life is governed by Him. My dreams are connected with Him. My future is in Him. My hope is in Him. My happiness, my satisfaction is connected to Him. And I understand that only in Him I will get that deepest desire, deepest desire for satisfaction which I have. This is what happens when I come to Christ. But when I accept that new identity, I need to leave that identity out in a practical way. Galatians 2, Paul explains us how it happened to him. Verse 19, For through the law I died to the law so that, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And look what he is saying after that. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is a practical way how Paul is living it out in his life. He is saying the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. So he is trusting Christ in every particular situation in his life. In the sixth chapter of Romans, the apostle speaks about two main components of that new life. And these two main components have two things. Number one, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. So first, if you want to live out your new identity, you need to think about yourself in a correct way. Romans 6, chapter, uh, ch chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Look at this statement. The statement in verse 10 explains what already happened to us. It explains that for the death he died, he died to sin once for all. So that explains what happened to us with Christ, in Christ. But the second portion uh, speaks about how it works. We have here a very clear imperative. You also must consider yourself. Some translations give consider yourself, regard yourself. This word is word legitzamai in original, and it's, it speaks about the way how we think about ourselves. Or the other way to translate it, remember that you are dead to sin and you are alive to Christ. So number one, what we need to have, we need to remind ourselves all the time, every day, that we have died with Christ. We have received a new identity in Him. And that new identity is the only thing which matters. And this is actually the best what can happen in this life to us. This is how Paul explains it in his letter to Colossians chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I will give you an example from the life of Jesus. You remember that Jesus was living in this earth, trusting his Father, and his life was heavenly minded. Everything that he was doing, he was doing in understanding that the Father has the best plan for him. You remember the time when Jesus was revealing to his disciples that he is going to Jerusalem and there he will be arrested and given to, into the hands of Gentiles and he will be crucified and he will be raised again, at the, raised from the grave at the third day. He was explaining to the, his disciples. And you remember the reaction of Peter? Peter came up to him and said, Lord, uh, let not this thing happen to you. Uh, we, we just don't want that. And Peter was kind of expressing his um, good desire, 
good feelings toward Jesus. And remember what Christ answered. Get behind me, Satan. And the most important, he said after that, because you are not thinking about what is God's, but you're thinking about what is human. You're thinking in earthly terms. And that's how it happens to us. That's how it happens. We, all the time we have that temptation. So let's go back there. Jesus is thinking in heavenly terms, in God's mind. So he's, he's seeing the cross ahead of him. And he understands that if he goes to the cross, it will be painful. He will have to suffer. He will have to go through a lot of troubles, physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual. So he understands, but he understands that that's, but that's still the best way. Why? Because after that, this is the way to victory. This is the way to overcome the greatest enemy of the world. This is the way to overcome Satan who is opposing God. So he understands this is his way of thinking. So here are the disciples. They are following Christ. They are learning from him. They are believing in him. So they have that time together. But they still think, think in earthly way. And when they look at the Calvary, when they look at those words of Christ, and they see, yeah, there is trouble. And probably the best way for us to avoid that trouble, this is how we think. But Jesus is saying to them and explaining to them, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God. When we don't set our mind on things of God, we lose all the time. Doesn't matter where and what circumstances. So that's number one. We need to consider, we need to think about ourselves according to our new identity. And number two, very quickly, do not present your members to sin, but present yourself to God. After we think correctly about ourselves, we have a duty, we have a responsibility to act out of that new identity. Verse 12 Romans 6, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instrument for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. The apostle says, let no sin control your life. Sin is not a king anymore. There had been a revolution. Christ came and liberated you from that, that slave owner that used to keep you enslaved. And now you need to make conscious decision to present your members of, members of your body. And that's an interesting way of say, saying. He's not just saying in general. He's saying in particular details. For that purpose, I try to write down different members of our body that we are using in our lives. Number one is your attention. So when, when, when he says present members of the body, so there is a certain faculty of our mind. We concentrate our attention on something. And there are two different ways of concentrated attention. We can present our attention and made it again a slave or an instrument of sin, or we can concentrate our attention on Christ. And most often, you know how it happens, most often for good Christians, our attention is not captivated by something clearly, openly sinful. Our attention most often, this is how Satan is doing that, is just taken out from the concentrating on the right things. I just explained to the first service, you know that the tragedy which happened in 2006, it was a huge worldwide. Try to remember it. Smartphone. Yeah, Tolik knows what it is. 
You know that in 2006, when the first smartphone was introduced, and that changed people. And number one, which it, it's destroying, is our ability to put our attention into the right things. What I discovered that even adults now have difficult time to read the Bible. You try to read the Bible, you read a couple of verses, then your phone blinks. So you're there just to check. It's just, just from the President of the United States, probably. You have direct message. And you need to read it right away. And you have those messages every 30 seconds from somewhere. And that's, that's a problem. Our attention should be given to God as an instrument of righteousness. Think about that. I use a smartphone, so I am as sinful as you are. But you know what I do? I have days specifically, I dedicate days when I don't check any messages. I have, I have time, okay, I have half an hour, I check my messages, so I put it away. And the reason why I do that is just to, not to lose my ability to concentrate. Because otherwise you will lose it. That's the new culture, which is kind of taking us away from the way how God designed it originally. And that's not, not all your thoughts, another one. Your feelings. You see someone who did something bad to you, and you have a choice. Your feelings can be filled with bitterness, and you can harness that. Or you can present your feelings as an instrument of righteousness to God, and instead of bitterness, you will be filled with forgiveness. That's a choice. One way will destroy you, you probably tried it. I know that all of us have that bad experience when we hid our, in ourselves bitterness. And the bitterness poisons us, first of all. You think about those people who offended you. You think about how bad they are. How could they do that? And you, you're kind of full of those feelings, but who is being destroyed by the, at, at that time? Not they. You are. That's, that's another way. Present your feelings as an instrument of righteousness. And you'll be better off. You will have a victorious life. And in the same way, your desires. Desires is a powerful force within us. In the same way, memory. What you remember. What you choose to remember. Your creativity, your ability to produce something creative is your instrument of righteousness or instrument of sin. That's another huge area where people are worshiping their creativity and as soon as they're creative, doesn't matter, all the moral principles are gone. It's so creative. But our creativity could enforce righteousness. Or can be enforcement of sin, which will bring destruction to our lives. And the list goes on. Your hearing, your eyes. You remember David? He was up on the, his roof, and he was just scanning, looking, and he saw that woman naked. And instead of turning away, his eyes away, what happened? His eyes became a destructive force. So he allowed that image in, and they captivated his thought process, and they captivated his feelings, and they took captive his desires, and then the whole body moves. And you remember how destructive was that? He destroyed one family, and he almost destroys his own life. 
That's the only, only one thing, eyes. Presented eyes to the work of, of, of sin. As instrument of sin. And this is what happens to us every day. Not to the same degree as David. But all the time. These kind of things happen. And this is what it means to belong to Christ. Your physical strength, your hands, your legs, your feet, your body, everything else. Everything else. This is what it means, Galatians 5.24, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Help us, Lord, in it. Let us bow down on our knees and pray to the Lord about it. Our Lord God, we thank you for this great blessing that you are blessing us with. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for your only Son, pure, righteous, loving, holy, who came to this sin-ridden world, came to suffer, came to show us true righteousness, came to demonstrate to us your true love, and came to take upon himself our sins and die for us. Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you that he once touched our hearts and he continues to work within us and he continues to bring us closer and closer to you. He continues to reinforce that new identity that we have in you. Now, Lord, I ask you about everyone who is here. You see every soul, you see all our struggles, you see the difficulties that we experience in different areas of our lives. Lord, we need you. And now we kneel down before you to express our dependence on you and to express our desire that you would take over our lives. Lord, help us to remember our, that we are dead to sin and we are alive for Christ, in Christ. Lord, help us to consider and to regard ourselves as new persons in Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to present members of our bodies as an instrument of righteousness into your possession that you would work in us and through us, that your name would be glorified and our lives would be filled with your true meaning and real fruit that only you can produce in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.